Welcome to the e-commerce masterclass. Today we're looking at apps, which is exercise 1000 in the masterclass program. And we're covering the basics around how you can extend e-commerce as a platform and make it work the way you want. My name is Soren and I will be your designated trainer today. First, we're taking a look at the framework first principle, which is the guiding star of how we design e-commerce as a platform. And basically what we realized over the years is that e-commerce is not about if you need to extend, rather it's about when and how much. Framework first enables that so you can get into any aspect of the platform and extend whatever you need. Components, UIs, anything. The user story we use to guide the implementation of the platform uh, is this. So as a developer, I want to be able to extend e-commerce in any way I want. So basically, get into any aspect of the platform and override the default behaviors. And again, it covers every aspect of the platform from UI to tax calculations to prices, anything that you would need to basically um, adapt to any user requirement. So how do we get there? Well, the basic premise of e-commerce is that everything is a component. We're looking at two examples of components right here. The first one is the uh, price service calculation. So basically the, the component re responsible for calculating any price of products in the system. Next up, an example of the tax service. So here we have uh, everything required to deal with taxes. Now, why is it important to be able to override any, uh, these aspects? Well, let's take taxes as an example. Taxes are interesting because they're so different across markets. So in the European Union, you will be dealing with a value added tax primarily in the US, US based uh, US sales tax. And so at the end of the day, you have two different approaches to, for dealing with taxes and there are many more, of course. And so it's key to be able to override the default implementation of taxes if you need it. Components are packaged up in apps. And so e-commerce apps encompass everything you need to override an aspect of e-commerce. So you'll notice here, looking at the e-commerce gift card app as an example, that it has everything it needs to execute. So you'll notice that we're looking at the e-commerce folder here, and we're sitting in the apps folder, and we're in the local folder for the gift card app. And if we take a look at the contents of the app, you'll notice that it has a local bin folder right here. So all the DLLs required to make the gift card app run are located right in the gift card app, as opposed to the, to the global bin app for, um, for the website. You'll also see that we have some configuration here, which contains the registrations of any components required. And we also have CSS and, and views, of course, to make the app run. So we have everything required for the app to, to run DLLs. We have the configuration to make e-commerce aware that the app is actually there. And we have the, the CSS and the UI required to interact with the app. Now, how do we build apps and how do we build the platform? Well, the overarching principle we use to design e-commerce is, is the solid principles that you may be familiar with. The solid principles are essentially a set of object-oriented design principles that will enable you to factor components so they have the right size, they have the right flexibility for reuse and so on and so forth. The five solid principles cover the single responsibility principle, the open closed principle, the Liskov substitution principle, the interface segregation principle, and the dependency inversion principle. We're going to go over a few of them that are sort of most central to the app platform. And the first one is the single responsibility principle. The general idea with the single responsibility principle is to have each component have one clear responsibility. As an example, we can take the, uh, the tax calculation before. Imagine we're doing a tax calculation and we have the rules that apply for that tax. So we do that and then we potentially make some rounding of that particular result that we get out. In that particular case, we're actually uh, breaking the single responsibility principle because now the tax component has the responsibility of calculating tax and also rounding numbers. So what we want to do to observe the single responsibility principle is to split those two responsibilities into two have two separate components to deal with, uh, with tax and with rounding. 
The reason we do this and what the single responsibility principle usually leads to is greater reusability of components. So if we take the, uh, the example from before, taxes uh, are something you're going to use in different aspects of the platform, right? For products, for services, for maybe for fees, things like that. So it needs to be reusable in those scenarios. And rounding is another great example where that logic needs to be used in multiple places as well. So we need it for tax, obviously, but we might also need it for uh, pricing where we want to control how many digits, for example, we display a price with. And there are many other examples. Observing the single responsibility principle enables us to reuse the rounding service, both for taxes and for pricing and el anywhere else really where rounding is required. And that's the promise of the single responsibility principle. The open close principle says that your code should be open to extension and close to modification. The idea is that you should be able to override code and behavior without actually changing the code. So if you think about it, that's really key for a platform company like WooCommerce because it enables us to ship a platform to you where you can actually change the behavior without having access to the code. And so the way it's usually done is through injection of somehow, and we're going to take a look at exactly how that works uh, in a little bit. The final principle we're covering today is the dependency inversion principle. The general idea here is that you want to make sure that your code depends on interfaces, not on actual implementation of class. So where you might be using today a class in your code, you say new whatever class you have, new customer or whatever, instead of doing that, you would use an interface so uh, you can actually abstract the, the actual implementation away. The solid principles are really about creating the right size of Lego for your code. That means that you can reuse those uh, Legos in other contexts, right? So we take the tax service from before or the rounding service. Single responsibility principle means that you actually have one thing that can be, you know, reused in other pr scenarios. And dependency inversion and open close means that you can replace the existing implementations that we provide with your own. Of course, it doesn't happen by itself. It needs some, some uh, frameworks to support it and to enable you to swap out components in WooCommerce, we supply a dependency injection container. We specifically use the Castle Windsor container. If you're familiar with that, you'll have a leg up. If not, you don't have to worry about it. The Castle Windsor dependency injection container is already set up by us, so you just need to use it. Basically what it is, it's a big uh, registration of every component found in WooCommerce and it enables you to get in there and remove one of our components and replace your own. So here's the example. We have the tax service from before. Uh, we have our own implementing uh, class here, the tax service that ships out of the box that deals with VAT. But if you need something else, you can go ahead and implement the iTax uh, interface and uh, you implement your own logic. Now, the key here is that when we look at the dependency inversion control in code, we're not actually relying on the actual class. So our implementation is called tax service, but you're not really aware of that because the code is really relying on the iTax service interface. So that's the dependency inversion principle right there, that we're depending on the interface, not the actual implementation. As you can see here, we're using constructor injection to, to get that component into another task where it's required. And we're doing the same thing for, for data access in this case. But you can really use this principle also in your own custom code. Once your own code is registered with WooCommerce, you can start to inject services that you need in your code in the constructor like this or via uh, optional injection via properties. The way you make WooCommerce aware that there's a new component is so. Basically, a component has three key pieces that you need to observe. It has an ID that needs to be unique if you're registering an all new service or if you're overriding an existing service, you need to re reuse the, the same ID. So if you want to take over for one component, say the tax service, you would reuse the, uh, the tax service ID uh, to make sure that you completely take over responsibility for this, print, for this particular component. The service piece of the component basically tells us the interface that, uh, that WooCommerce should be aware of. So the first bit here is the namespace and the next bit is the actual uh, type. 
right? So in this case, the interface. And the final bit is the DLL. So generally, we don't change this unless we're actually registering a completely new component. In most cases, you'll just leave this in place and work with the type instead, because the type is the actual implementation of the actual interface. So here, it's the same thing again. We have the namespace and we have the type. And in this case, case, it's a class that sits in one of the UCommerce DLLs. So that's a full component that goes into our configuration files that we're going to take a look at in a little bit. And um, so to override, it would basically look like this, right? So we have the same component as before, the same ID, the same service, because we generally don't change that unless we're doing a whole new component that UCommerce doesn't know about in advance. And then you can see here how the type has been changed. So we're in a custom namespace, we're in a custom class, and we're in a DLL that you control. Adding this component registration to an app will basically enable you to take over for the tax service. Another option for components are parameters. And these parameters can be anything from other components that need to be injected. They can be, as in this case, little configuration bits. But generally speaking, you just go ahead and say, add the parameters uh, element, and then you refer to the actual uh, name of the constructor parameter or the or a property on the class. So in this case, the number of digits precision for the price calculation is a property on a, on a class. And that basically enables you to override the, um, the, uh, the value in an app. You'll notice here that it's a partial component. And we'll actually cover that in the next uh, slide here if you're wondering what that is. So a partial component basically enables you to not register all of the bits of a component. So you'll recall that we said that there are three p key pieces to a component, ID, service, and type. But in this case here, you're not actually seeing those uh, other two bits, the type and the service. And that's because this parcel component has been registered elsewhere in the system. And so it doesn't need that additional stuff because we're just targeting the things we're interested in overriding. So just this one here. So there are actually two registrations at play here. There's one just with the component and ID of calculation settings. And a second one, which is the one we're looking at, which is a partial component that adds additional stuff. Conceptually, you can think of partial components almost like partial classes in .NET, in that you have part of the uh, registration of, of, uh, of, the, of the class in one file and another part of the registration in another file. And they sort of get mushed together at one time. You can see here as well that, um, that we, we can do the same thing for the tax service. We can add other types of parameters as well. So in this case, the interceptor parameter. All this is neatly wrapped up in, uh, in an API that will enable you to get at these uh, components. So let's just take a look at that. It's called Object Factory. An Object Factory basically enables you to resolve these components through the system. And so there are basically three ways of resolving. Resolve T, so here you would generally ask for I tax service or I whatever you need. That will give you back the defa default implementation, either the one you come supplies out of the box, or in cases where components are overridden, you would get the custom implementation. In some cases, you, could, you also need to resolve specifically for an ID, and that would be in cases where you have multiple implementations of the same interface. So if you take the iPayment method interface, for example, which is the one that governs payment service uh, integrations, you will have actually multiple implementations of that, one for each gateway uh, that we support. So in, in the UCOMS case, we have, I think, around 20, 25 uh, overriding implementations of the same thing. And so the ID becomes important, right? So you can say, I want specifically the PayPal integration, or I want the... Uh, Sage pay integration or whatever integration we're talking about. And the final one is resolve all that will basically give you every implementation of a particular interface back. Again, if you just need to do a visitor pattern, something like that, the resolve all is generally very useful for that. The last one, register services for T, is, uh, is about learning which IDs are actually available for a particular interface. So take the example of the uh, iPayment method service from before. If you want a list of every implementation available, you can call register services for T, and that will give you back a list of all the IDs available. So it's very handy for UIs where you need to let the user uh, select which, um, which implementation to use. 
Now, with all that in place, I think it would be good to take a look at the, um, at the configuration files for WooCommerce. You can see all the component registrations and where to find those. So let's swap into the uh, virtual machine here. And I'll open up Windows Explorer. And I've already navigated into my iNet pub. So whether you're using Sitefinity, uh, Kentico, Sitecore, or Braco, it doesn't really matter. The app folder is and the configuration is the same across all these CMSs. So I'm just using uh, the Umbraco uh, CMS as an example here. So I'll navigate to the uh, WooCommerce folder, which sits in the Umbraco folder right here. And we have a folder called Configuration. And inside of Configuration, we have all the native configurations of WooCommerce right out the box. So let's just go over these one at a time to give you a sense of what's there. So the Components config is the primary configuration that basically links in all the other configurations. So it doesn't hold any configuration itself, it just points to other configuration files. Next up is the core configuration. These are all the core components of uh, WooCommerce. Price calculations, tax calculations, anything that pertains to the domain of e-commerce particularly are in there. I can briefly talk about custom config. Basically, this is a leg legacy configuration file that you shouldn't use uh, back in the day. This is the was the way before apps that to get configuration in. This is deprecated. It's still there for backwards compatibility, but you should really not use it. You should add an app instead and a configuration file in there. If we take a look at the data types, these are all the little editor pieces for uh, when you're working with definitions in WooCommerce. So if you need to see which editors are in there, like a short text editor or a number editor, something like that, they will be in there. The marketing configuration contains everything around marketing foundation. So discounts and things of that nature. Payments, it's actually, it includes all the payment providers we have. Presenters includes all of the uh, logic in the back end around how views act. So all the business logic around views. So when you're editing a product or a price or something like that, there will be a presenter that deals with the business logic, sort of like a controller in MVC. Search governs, of course, a search engine. So all the uh, particulars around the, uh, the Raven DB. Shell is the actual configuration. This varies from CMS to CMS. So each version of WooCommerce for different CMSs will have a different shell config. So whenever we need an integration with, say, the member system in Embraco or the personalization system in, uh, in Kentico, they will be in there. And we will ship with a different one for each CMS. Shipping is all the shipping providers and the synchronization config, which contains any components pertaining to import and export of data from WooCommerce. We have settings as well, which is pertinent to what you do. The settings file contains, you know, not components, but the settings for the components. So if you need to override settings that, you know, sometimes are found in web config, uh, you, you would actually go here instead. So the settings config holds all that information. And the payments include um, any configuration required for payment forms. All that is actually stored in the database these days. So not so much there. Let's take a look at the app folder as well, just to give you a sense of how that works. So each folder here is an app. Uh, and uh, all you need to do to register an app is basically drop in a folder, right? So you'll notice here that we have some configuration and one of these configurations uh, holds partial components, right? So in this case here, we're overriding a component called to completed order and we're adding some stuff to that. The beautiful thing here is that you don't have to edit all the core configurations that we took a look at. If you want to override something, you just use the same ID as the existing component, but with a different type. Or if you want to add something uh, to an existing component, you use a partial component to do so. All right. All right, back to the slides here. So that's a look at the, um, at the app platform of WooCommerce. Remember, WooCommerce is built using that framework first principle, which uses the solid principles to factor apps out and factor out the platform to enable you to have the right size of Legos. Apps are located in the uh, WooCommerce folder and they basically are there self-contained to override any aspects of WooCommerce, whether it be the way we edit products in the back end or price calculations or anything at all. And go in and override that. That was, the, that was exercise 1000 apps of the WooCommerce Masterclass. I hope you enjoyed it. Have a good day.